Hello, Rebels of the Sharp Illusion. Normally, I start off this podcast by saying hi, but I'm going to start this one off by saying hydration. We know how important hydration is for our bodies. It's the thing that keeps us running, right? You want to be a well-oiled machine. You want to be running efficiently. You know what can help you run efficiently? Liquid IV. It is the category-winning hydration brand fueling your well-being and their hydration multiplier is the one product that you are missing in your daily routine. It comes in a little stick that's a powder and in just one stick you get five essential vitamins and two times faster hydration than water alone. If you use it first thing in the morning maybe before a workout when you feel run down maybe after a long night out and doing a little party you know what I mean and what if you have like a long flight or something like that and you just right we all feel that way so add this to your water and that convenient packaging can go with you anywhere you go even if you're going to the gym or you're traveling or you're at work and maybe you didn't have a great breakfast at least it's something that will fuel you up in the morning and there's a whole bunch of flavors that are available like sea berry strawberry lemonade concord grape lemon lime pina colada tropical punch watermelon strawberry passion fruit guava acai berry did i say that right i never know how to say that but Those are just some of the flavors. Here's some statistics for you folks. One stick of liquid IV in 16 ounces of water contains five essential vitamins, B3, B5, B6, B12, and even vitamin C. And we all know how important those B vitamins are. It's got three times the electrolytes of traditional sports drinks. It's made with premium ingredients. It's non-GMO and it is free from gluten, dairy, and soy. I'm going to offer you a great deal, Rebels. If you go to liquidiv.com and use offer code SHERPA, you can get 20% off of anything that you order on that site when you're shopping for some better hydration. So that's Liquid IV. Check it out at liquidiv.com. podcast that you're listening to is being presented to you in cooperation with the SJ Network. If you're a person who'd like to appear on a podcast, contact Stephen Joyner at s-j-network. Dot com. Let's get on with the show. This week on the Sherpa Screening Room, it's an interview with singer-songwriter Danny Hagen. You'll also hear some of her music, too. Do you know why the farmer started a rock band? He was tired of hollow notes. Coming to you from Sherpa Chalet in beautiful downtown Mount Podcastia, it's time for entertainment interviews in the Sherpa Screening Room. Grab an aisle seat and a bucket of popcorn, but don't crunch too loud or you'll miss the show. Now, he's your host, Jim, the podcast Sherpa. Hello there, Rebels of the Sherpa Lution. Welcome to the Sherpa Screening Room. It is a presentation of Too Many Podcasts, and I am Jim, the Podcast Sherpa, your guide, of course, to everything in podcastia. And every once in a while, we like to do something a little bit different, and today we are rocking it out. We've got an interview with a singer-songwriter named Danny Hagen. She's coming to us from L.A., and she's got a hot new EP out called Kissing You, and we're going to get to talk to Danny, and first, we're going to let you hear the title track of that EP right now. Just for the night, we lay it all on the line 
I don't want to think Cause I'm on the brink of kissing you Hello there, Rebels, and welcome to the Sherpa Screening Room. My guest today has a hot new EP out. It is called Kissing You. She's coming to us from Los Angeles, California. Her name is Danny Hagen. Danny, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here, Jim. I'm glad to have you here. Now, oh, we were just saying before, I wanted to mention a word to kick off the interview because I thought it was kind of unique for especially a singer. And the word is synesthesia. And you said you had this. Could you kind of explain to everybody first before we chat a little bit about it? Sure. Synesthesia is a neural cross-wiring of the senses. And there's lots of different variables or variations of synesthesia. And I've identified about 10 versions that I have. The most prominent being when I hear music, I see colors. Okay. And I didn't, I've had it my whole life, but I didn't have the understanding that it wasn't normal until I came across it in a textbook as I was studying some neurology for my health and wellness. And I came across the anesthesia and I, and I read the description of it. I was like, wait, I have that. This is a condition. <laughs> <laughs> and putting language to it helped me to really understand it and start to exercise the synesthesia a little bit. So it's kind of like a muscle where it's, I feel like it's been getting stronger and more prominent the more that I'm understanding and embracing it. And it explains a lot of my childhood and how I process music and why it moves me in so many different ways, not only emotionally, but energetically and physically and visually. There's there's so much stimulation that happens with music. So that's the the, the biggest version that I have is that I often see colors when I hear music. Okay. So when you're writing your songs, are you visioning a color? You you say this song should sound red. Is that the way that it works? Not necessarily. For me, when, when there's lyrics involved and there's words involved, my brain pulls focus over into that direction. And so I'm thinking about the stories. And so the colors kind of go down on a back burner. But if you put me in a room full of musicians, especially brass instrument, like live brass instruments, it mm -hmm. is a firework light show of, of colors. And it's absolutely wild, especially when there's no lyrics to pull focus. But I find myself using descriptive words that are very much like, this isn't muddy enough or no, the colors that sounds too bright. I need to bring it darker down over here. And it's taken me a while to realize I'm like, people don't understand what I mean when I say that, because I'm describing what I'm seeing and in addition to what I'm hearing and, and not everybody processes music the same way. So it's been very interesting to learn that about myself. And I've come to a, a greater understanding of myself through recognizing that quote unquote diagnosis of synesthesia. So with your new EP that's out, you would really see a lot of different colors in that because it's all different stories. All different stories. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I haven't explored it that much in my own music because I get, I am such a storyteller and a lyricist. And, mm -hmm. and again, I'm so focused on my part of the music of singing and performing of it, where I don't get to fully surrender into the experience of the colors of it. So that would actually, I'm going to take that as homework from you <laughs> to, to go and just put on some headphones and surrender into my synesthesia on my own music. Cause I don't think I've explored that yet. And that's a timidness on my own end because I'm still exploring. That's interesting. I'm definitely going to do that. Thank you. <laughs> you know, now, well, now that you bring that up, that's that's an interesting point, though, because I'm wondering if if you put that in your mind, do you think that that's going to force you to write certain types of music or, or change things or, or are you just going to kind of take it as as it is already? I'm, I'm very accepting of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't necessarily have or I haven't learned the control of the colors or how they correlate to different notes. Okay. It's just. It's a it's a very overstimulating experience that just happens to me rather than me like interacting with sort of thing, especially as I've learned. 
I describe it as having a volume knob on my synesthesia. Like I've learned how to turn it up and how to turn it down. And that's about the only control that I have on it. But it's it's a superpower. I'm really excited to explore. <laughs> so, all right, just so that I understand this once and for all. So basically it's just there. You don't have no control out of what colors you're going to see and what it's going to make you see. And whatever is there, it, that's that's the quote unquote picture that it paints. Correct. It's almost like watching a movie that's projecting over reality. Okay. I think that works. <laughs> now, now we've even educated all these listeners out here too on something that they probably never heard of. There's actually quite a few, big portion of the population has it. I believe it's two to 3% of the population. And most of those people that have synesthesia tend to be art of some sort because it's a very very artistic way to experience the world. I think it's also probably an interesting album title. (laughs) You know, but but you have to put it with like an unrelated word, like industrial synesthesia or something like that. (laughs) It's interesting because it's just been in the last couple of years that I've really discovered what it is. And Mm -hmm. in the new songs that I'm recording next month, there is references to synesthesia where like, if you don't know that I have synesthesia or not aware of what it is, it's just going to fly right over your head. But if you Mm -hmm. do know the backstory or anything about me as an artist, you'll be like, Ooh, that right there. I know that secret. So I'm excited to start revealing those little hints in my music. So you really started since you were five, from what I understand. Mm -hmm. And and you, and you really did like a wide array of, of talents. I mean, with with acting and dancing and singing. Yeah. All of acting, singing and dancing have always held hands. You can't do one without the other. So I was part of these different schooling opportunities. There was a summer performing arts company that I was a part of. I was part of the dance team. I was part of fire hall theater, community theater. I was just in absolutely every creative outlet that my mother could find for me, including voice lessons and eventually instrument lessons and every choir, every vocal competition. I was fully submerged in it. And you even did a movie once, is that correct? I actually did a couple of movies. I came from LA from New York City with the intention of being an an actress. And I very quickly missed the stage. So I pivoted. I grabbed my guitar. I started performing on the Sunset Boulevard with my guitar and never looked back. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I've done a couple of films. The biggest one was called Purge, where I was the lead actress in it. And it did really well. And I'm really proud of that work that I did. But so I I love acting. I love anything Mm -hmm. entertainment wise, but music has my heart. I was just going to ask that that's probably got to be the thing that that probably calls to you the most more than anything else. Yeah, well, but I'm also very much a visual artist. So my music, I think every single song that I've put out has been paired with a music video. And so that's my expression of the music visually and also through the lens of an actress. Mm-hmm. So I'm always looking for ways to express the music in different in different lanes, I guess. Sure. And I guess, you know, as long as you are promoting with music video too, being comfortable in front of a camera, if it comes natural to you, it probably even adds a little bit more credence to the song. Like if you're angry, you know, you're going to show that real anger and the the camera is going to pick up on that. Absolutely. I've always worn my expressions on my face. Like I just, I can't hide what I'm feeling. You'll see it float across my face without any... (laughs) without any censoring. So I've used that to my advantage as a performer and to help convey the emotions of the songs, whether it's in a live performance or in a music video. Yeah, my expressions are, they've always been there. (laughs) For folks that are listening to this interview on, you know, whether on a podcast app or on YouTube or whatever, they're going to hear two of your songs. They're going to hear Kissing You and Good Guy. How do you classify your music? Do you put a label on it or it's just like you're playing what you feel? For marketing purposes, you have to put a label on it from an mm-hmm. artistic perspective. Nobody likes labels, okay. but <laughs> I, I'm often classified as blues rock okay. or roots rock. So it's it's great storytelling with a rock and roll band and a female singer. And some people automatically categorize us in country music and I would never claim to be country, but I'd be honored if they claimed me. Uh, For me, it's just telling the story and what comes out. And it often comes out bluesy simply because of my songwriting techniques and my lack of technical training. 
I hear and I see the music as I'm playing it and I make up these chords on the guitar or on the piano. And then my professional musicians, my band will come up and they'll be like, oh, that's actually a seventh over a fifth inverted C chord, E chord or something. <laughs> Again, I don't have this right anymore. <laughs> But it turns out I'm making this very interesting jazz chords. So. Okay. <laughs> They're Danny chords, right? <laughs> I love that you said that. My band has nicknamed them Danny chords. They're like, oh, it's another Danny chord. It's this one. Or, oh, it's another, it's a Danny rhythm because I change time signatures and rhythms all the time. And it's endlessly frustrating and invigorating for my musicians. <laughs> now, who are some of the artists that influenced your style? I'm heavily influenced by ZZ Ward, and she's an incredible blues rock hip hop artist that I adore. And then also Grace Potter, who's been around for a bit longer, and she's just like the rock and roll queen of current times, I'd say. And yeah, those two have a heavy, heavy influence on on my music. Also, Gary Clark Jr. Love him. You know, I'm going to get a little obscure on you, maybe. I don't know. I don't know how, how deep your music love goes. When I heard your songs, there was a band in the 80s called Quarter Flash. Have you ever heard of them? No. Okay. They had two hits called Harden My Heart and Find Another Fool. And the style of your music isn't their style, but your vocal tone is very similar to the lead singers. Oh, I'm going to have to check this out. Okay. Because I was like... I was like, why does this voice sound so familiar? And it's that same like great range. I mean, and that was actually to be my next question. I know because you actually have a background as an opera singer as well. Oh, once upon a time, forever ago. Yes, I have a, a lot of classical training when it comes to vocalizing. So I was a competitive opera singer and I hid that fact for the longest time. I didn't want anybody to know about it because it puts you into a category, it puts you into a box or a typecasting. And I, and I didn't want to get, I was trying to break out of those molds that I was raised in. Mm -hmm. And now I'm far enough removed from it where I'm like, okay, let's throw it into a rock and roll song. <laughs> so we've actually, I've actually written a song recently. It's called Haunted. I wrote it with my co my co-writer, Aaron Medina, who's also my guitarist. We put together a new song and it, it's very reminiscent of Evanescence, but it allows my vocals to just soar up in that opera range. And it's been a lot of fun to return to those old hidden roots of mine. Yeah, I, I would think that that would be like a natural progression, too, because, I mean, you can think of like a lot of rock singers who do actually have that operatic quality to their voice, like Roger Daltrey or even Benatar, who I think was studying to be an opera singer before she went to rock. Yeah. It's funny. I interviewed a gentleman a couple of years back and he was from Italy and he was he sang in a rock band and he wanted to learn to sing better. So they said, you should learn how to sing opera. So he became an opera singer. He went in the opposite direction that you went in. Yeah. Well, it's an instrument. You should learn how to play it from every possible angle. Absolutely. Tell us a little bit about Kissing You. Well, Kissing You, the, the song itself was the first song that I ever wrote on my first electric guitar. And I do not claim to be a guitarist. I play guitar. It's a writing tool. But I came up with this really simple riff and relationship that I was in at the time. It was that the expression that I was going through. Mm -hmm. And... I remember taking the song into the recording studio and we had another guitarist who's an amazing guitarist and he was playing on it. He's like, what if we did this instead? And my producer, Michael Blue, was like, no, 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 no. You have to go back to that simple, clean riff that she did. That's the hook of the song. And you'll hear it's the bum, 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 bum. So, um, yeah, that was amazing to be able to cut that song because it was the first song that I wrote on my guitar. And then it's the title track of the EP. The song itself is a little bit of, departure of a relationship and the album title kissing you is more of an invitation of the overall i'm very rock and roll but i'm also very romantic and i'm very like i, I love that feminine sensual energy thrown in with the hard rock and everything and that's what i think really makes interesting sound for the listener i at least i hope now working with like a professional producer and on this and i know you had some incredible musicians on the album as well i do oh my goodness well michael blue is absolutely iconic in the music industry. He's known primarily for launching Colby Calais and Jason Mraz and working with One Republic. And so again, when he's working with me, it's just 
it blows my mind that I get to work with this caliber of a producer. And then he gives me his inventory of musicians as we're recording. So Greg Bissonette has been the drummer on most of my tracks. And Greg Bissonette is Ringo Starr's drummer. And if Ringo Starr, who's a drummer, <laughs> has a drummer, and that's Greg Bissonette, He's pretty damn amazing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're in good hands. <laughs> I'm in good hands. He's absolutely inspiration to work with. So now I understand you were you were mentored by Jeff Barry. Yes. For those who don't know who Jeff Barry is, he probably wrote so many incredible pop songs for the 60s and the 70s. He wrote, I honestly love you. Uh then he kissed me, I think, right? Then he kissed me, sugar, sugar. Yeah. Um go into the chapel. Yeah. I was raised on his music without knowing who Jeff Berry was. Jeff Berry was a songwriter in the 60s. It was when it was really, really blowing up. And he was a songwriter of that entire generation. And my grandmother had bought me an album called Little Girls All Grown Up. And it was riddled with his songs. And I was introduced to this guy named Jeff. And we hit it off. He told me he was a songwriter. And we were just having a conversation And the second time I met him, he's like, I feel like I should tell you who I am. (laughs) (laughs) So he gave me his full name and I looked him up and I was like, I was literally raised on your music. I was raised on your music. And he was so touched by that. And we had just bonded so naturally. So he took me under his wing and helped workshop all of my songs and mentor me as a songwriter and brought me to my first music festival. And... Yeah, he's and and to this day is still one of my biggest fans and an incredible influence on my life. So it was such a full circle moment to be raised on his music and then to write songs with him sure. is insane. Yeah, not too many people would get to realize that dream. I think <laughs> that's a pretty long shot. What advice did he give you for songwriting? Take out as many words as you possibly can. Songwriters love to like, I got to get the whole story in there and uh, did, 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 eliminate all that. Take out all the thes, take out all the the extra, leave space. And that was such a big lesson. And then also to, he taught me how to trust a microphone because I was such a musical theater kid. I thought that I had to sing to the back of the, the theater as a theater kid. And as a musician, I have a microphone right in front of me. And he had taken me to Aspen for this songwriting festival with John Oates. Mm -hmm. And I had a little mini showcase at this festival. I had written a song and he was just trying to gently coach me on it. There's one song that I wrote where I start with just, and he's like, the microphone picks you up on little tiny breath. So when you're singing, let the microphone do its job. Stop trying to sing over everybody. And it was that was such an impactful lesson for me as a performer, making mm-hmm. the transition from you know musical theater and opera at moving into rock music, pop music, whatever it was at that time. So he, man, I could probably write a book on all of the gems that he gave me along the way. He called it, he would go, I'm just taking a little Jeff Berry dusting. And, and he would just magically dust <laughs> his influence over my songs without ever wanting like a songwriting credit or anything like that. He was just a mentor in the best possible way. I think if anybody who works with him gets even half the success that he's had as a songwriter, that's a, that's a pretty impressive career. He's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as a songwriter. That's, sure. that's incredible. Yeah. So you started in a small town in North Dakota. North Dakota, Grand Forks. And then you ended up going by coastal. I guess you went, like you said, you went to New York and then ended up in Los Angeles. Yep. What advice would you give to people who want to start out in the music business? I know it's probably, you know, one of the toughest things that a person's got to do and you got to take that dive. But what do you think works for you? I have a couple of superpowers, synesthesia being one of them and another being my intuition. And I just follow my own lead. And so many times the stars just align in front of me and I have to, if you see them, just follow them and it'll lead you in the right direction. At least it has for me. And the other thing is show up, come out, go to the shows, meet the people. You don't have to be the one on stage, be the one making progress in your career. So if you go and you say like, this person looks interesting, let me go have a conversation. Maybe you end up with a a new fan or maybe you meet, you meet your new manager. You have no idea because there's always somebody interesting in the audience. So show up, take notes, learn things. Don't use judgment, but just absorb, be a sponge. Mm -hmm. And there's, I've come to realize there is so much room in this town that is so full of talent. There's so much room for everybody to be successful. 
However, not everybody is willing to do the amount of work. So if you show up and if you do the work and you're consistent and persistent, that's going to add up to success. And it's, it, you should come up with your own definition of success and allow that to evolve as you learn the lessons along the way. Because when you're young and you're like, I, when I get on this big stage, then I'll have made it. When you get to that big stage, you're like, oh my God, I have so far to go. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to learn to love the journey more than anything. I, I was listening to an interview that you gave and you were saying that one day you were performing literally at Carnegie Hall mm -hmm. and then the next day you were working in a restaurant. Yep. I, it was such a, uh, and that moment was just so wild for me because I was living out a dream I didn't know I had. I, I had given up on opera so long ago. So Carnegie Hall wasn't even on my radar as an artist anymore. And, and this opportunity to write with Rod Lolly and then chart on Billboard Top 100 and then go and perform the song at Carnegie Hall was just like this snowball of this dream coming to having this awakening. And so I'm at Carnegie Hall. I mean, that's that's such a dream. And then literally get on that plane back to LA and I'm working as a maitre d' in a restaurant. But the best thing about that was to be on that iconic, beautiful stage. The sound is unreal, but there's a disconnect with the audience. The audience is so far away and, and you're up there with a full orchestra and everything. It's, it was cosmic experience on its own, but I love my little hole in the wall stages of Los Angeles. I love the tiny stage where I can see the back of the house. It's still full. It's a big, a big crowd, but it feels intimate. And I love that intimacy and that personal connection that you can make with an audience on a smaller stage. So the definition of success has evolved over the years. Absolutely. You know, I like to ask some of the musical guests that I have, do you have a dream collaboration with somebody? Ooh, dream collaboration. Uh, it could be anyone living or dead, we'll, we'll say. Well, I've always had a crush on Elvis. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there's this there's a performance of his where it's acoustic. I think he might even be on the guitar or maybe there's a guitarist next to him. And he's just so charming and so flirty. And he like messes up the song. He stops it and starts it over. And the whole time I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> there's something uh, you can't put your finger on that star quality. And I would just love to be in the same room as him for a moment. <laughs> I like that. That's that, that's a good choice. I guess if you're gonna go pick somebody to collaborate with, you know, go big. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I was raised on that music of of the eras of you know the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. That was what was on repeat in my bedroom as a kid. So, what do you think is going to be next after? I, I don't know. Your EP is out, and you're going to probably be doing some touring with your band. Mm -hmm. And what'll go after that? You're going to do another album similar, or are you going to branch out a little bit more? How, what are you? What are you thinking? We are making those plans right now mm -hmm. and dreaming up the dreams, and that's part of my personal work that I'm doing as an artist right now is is laying out my short term and my long term goals in terms of the next year and the next five years. It's just a great exercise for everybody to do every year, anyway. But sure. I'm at that point right now. It's like okay, I gotta think this through, but I'm booked in the recording studio in December. And so I've got six songs. I'm trying, well, I've got, you know, 40 songs. I narrowed it down to six songs that I'm okay. going to, that I wrote over the last year. So these songs, I'm going to try and narrow it down to four songs to record. And we're hitting the road. We're going out on tour. We're trying to do some US touring, but also heading out to the UK. I'm, I'm apparently making a splash in the UK. I'm on all these radio stations. I'm on the UK talk radio charts right now where people are voting for my music. I'm like, I don't know how this happened, but <laughs> sign me up. I'm jumping over the pond right now. <laughs> You'll take it, right? I will take it. So hopefully I'll head over to London, shoot some more music videos and get the next EP out. And we've got merch coming up and we're, so the ball, the snowball is rolling and it's getting bigger as we go. So I'm starting to break out of the constraints of uh, you know, that you think you can only do so much and you can do so much more. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm spreading my wings a little bit and flying a little bit higher. And, and I like the view from up here. <laughs> <laughs> so as I mentioned earlier, uh, people will be able to hear two of the songs from your album by listening to this episode, but where else can people go if they want to hear some more? Wherever you stream your music, if it's on Spotify or Apple 
you can go see all my music videos on YouTube. Again, that's a big, important expression of my music is the visuals of it. So the music videos are on YouTube. And of course, I'm on all the socials. But if you want just a, a landing zone, go to dannyhagen.com and you can all the links. You can just click a button and you'll arrive right at all my stuff. <laughs> there we go. The album again called Kissing You. Her name is Danny Hagen. Danny, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. It was great to have a chat with you. We're on that internet thingy at sharepollution.com. A very special thanks to Danny Hagen for coming by the show. And if you want to hear more tracks from Kissing You, make sure to buy it from wherever you find great music and it'll be there, I'm sure. And if you want to listen to a great podcast, or at least a decent one, you know, maybe one that features me. Yes, that's right. Just come back here week after week and subscribe on your favorite podcast app, wherever it might be. And if you don't have a favorite podcast app, if you hate all of them, listen to me on sharpolution.com or the Sharpolution YouTube channel. I'm there. I promise you. And please feel free to reach out to me on social media at Sharpolution. Where else? At Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and even that TikToky thing. <laughs> I don't know. And we've got this contest thing going on and leave us a nice review on Apple Podcasts and let me know and you can be entered. You will be entered into a contest where you will win podcast merchandise. Lovely. Well, thank you so much for listening. And until then, I will see you guys next time. And until then, viva la sharp pollution. <laughs> listening to the Sherpa Screening Room. 
Don't forget to subscribe, rate, review, and share this podcast. I'm Mr. Bruce, and this has been a Sherpa Lou Studios production. Viva la Sherpa Lution. You know, Rebels, if you've been checking out some of my promotional ads on social media, you will be aware that I have been using a lot of AI programs to help me create ads. But you know what? There's a lot more uses for AI than just funny little videos. And I'd like to introduce one of our new sponsors, Podium. It is a leader in creating AI tools for podcasters. Now, let's say you've got a podcast or maybe you're even thinking of doing a podcast. You're probably wondering, well, how can AI be integrated with your workflow? I'll tell you about Podium. As a podcaster, you know that writing show notes and creating chapters and transcribing episodes takes a lot of time and it can cost you a lot of money too. But you know what? That's where Podium comes in. It's an AI tool designed specifically for creators and podcasters with the goal of making post-production tasks quick and easy. And in just a few minutes, Podium generates show notes, chapters, summaries, clips for social media, a full transcript, suggested episode titles, social media posts, and more. Whew, that's a lot of work for one little program. Your show notes are key to your podcast's success because it helps new listeners find your podcast and they'll know if it's a fit for them. You know, kind of like too many podcasts. It also improves your SEO. That's your search engine optimization. Ooh, big phrase there. And overall accessibility. And with Podium, you can focus on creating a great podcast and let Podium's AI do the heavy lifting. But Podium isn't just for solo creators and podcasters. It's a game changer for editors, producers, marketers, agencies, and production studios Teams that use Podiums are able to increase workloads, decrease turnaround times, and improve their quality. How does it work? Very easy. First, go to Podium's website, and you'll see that link that's right there in the show notes. You get three hours free just to try it. Pretty cool, huh? And using that link also supports this show as well. And you know what else happens? Because I'm a good guy. You use my link, you will get 50% off for your first month. So visit the site, upload an MP3 file, and download your files, and that's it. And if you need anything else, you can use Podium GPT to generate articles and any marketing copy you might need in seconds instant show notes transcripts chapters for your podcast or channel this will level up that podcast so check out podium today